Hello, my name is uh, Joyce uh, Gehlen and I'm a, I'm a pediatrician and I'm a pediatrician specialized in developmental and uh, genetic pediatrics. And I also work in, uh, in the Radboud uh, University Hospital in uh, Nijmegen together with uh, Professor Kleefstra and with, uh, with Joost. Uh, so, and it's a great honor for me to present my, uh, my work, uh, which I performed on growth in children with Kleefstra syndrome. I work for, uh, I think, four or five years now as a pediatrician uh, uh, on these children. And I was really interested uh, as a pediatrician in, in growth. So I will share my data, at a, I will share my data with you. Uh, the content of my talk is, is a short introduction. I will show you my methods, the results and the conclusions we, we draw from, uh, from the results. And of course, what does this mean eh, for, for my child? And I also like to tell something about future research we want to, uh, we want to perform. Um, as a pediatrician, uh, growth is very important for me because it's the key feature in well-being of children. Uh, every appointment a child has on, on our outpatient clinic, we will measure heights and weights eh, because this is very important to use our growth charts. Eh, and, and we can learn a, a lot from, uh, from, these, uh, from these factors. And also head circumference is something we measure every time because eh, this, this shows us something about the well-being of a child. And eh, when you look uh, at the growth of a child, you also have specific measures like sitting height. And sitting height is actually the height of the when the child sits on the table and you measure the, uh, the head and the, and the back. And then you can also calculate the length of the legs. You can also calculate the length of the arms. We also use the body mask index, which, which is a calculated uh, uh, measure of height and weight. It's a well-known international uh, uh, value. And we can also use skin fold thickness, yeah, where we measure skin folds with a spe specialized equipment, which also shows something about uh, the growth in, uh, growth in children. And um, growth is influenced by many, many, factor, many factors. So it's always good to think about everything which is involved in the growth of children. And when children are below two years of age, uh, especially the nutritional intake is a very important factor for growth. Yeah? And, and when they are above two, also um, 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 hormones get into place and they yeah, also have their effect on growth, like growth hormone, uh, insulin and also the puberty hormones have influence on growth and of course also the metabolism of food and uh, which is caused by the thyroid glands and also how much um, exercise you have is of influence of of the metabolism of food and uh, so it's a very delicate balance uh, of intake of metabolism and of endocrine functions uh, that will lead to to growth and normal growth and also when there is a problem with growth and what I also like to, to stress is, of course, the genetic predisposition, which is also important for growth, because we always calculate the parental target range in which a child should grow. If the parents are taller, then also the child becomes taller or should become taller. So this is also of influence on, uh, on growth. And if we look at one factor, I showed you uh, the nutritional intake. Also in the nutritional intake, there are many, many factors which play, which play a role, especially uh, when you have inadequate nutritional intake. I will not show you to all the details of this, uh, of this slide, but I want to show how um, difficult growth can be. And when you look at the inadequate, inadequate nutritional intake, uh, then, of course, um, um, when you have like uh, a, a problem with head control or movement control or abnormal muscle tone, this is of influence on your nutritional intake. And of course, also your oral motor dysfunction. So how good are you possible to, to swallow and to, to chew it also has an uh, important factor on nutritional intake. And of course, also gastrointestinal problems like constipation, they all influence if you have an inadequate nutritional intake. And so also all the other factors can also be influenced by all kinds of, uh, all kinds of situations. 
And um, the other important factor, like I already stressed, is the, the genetic predisposition on growth. So I told you that, of course, the parental height is important, but also we know that uh, in specific syndromes, you have specific growth patterns. And I included in my presentation already some growth charts of specific syndromes. This first one is uh, of the Kabuki children with the Kabuki syndrome. Uh, the the um, uh, a research group has made a growth chart for these groups of children. This, the middle one is of um, Williams syndrome, it's especially for, for male. So you can use this, this growth chart to plot a child with Williams syndrome to see if they grow properly according to their syndrome. And also this one is on Noonan syndrome. And it's also a syndrome where uh, children become less tall than uh, normal children. And it's always very nice to see, to compare them to children with, their, with the same syndrome. So just to show you that there are very specific growth patterns in specific, specific syndromes. So we were very interested in uh, the growth in, in persons with Kleefstra syndrome. Uh, because uh, we didn't uh, have any growth chart at the moment eh, that we uh, that we started and we looked in the literature to see if we already could find something about growth and especially weight was mentioned in the, in literature because this is an article of 2003 and it's about two a patient with Kleefstra syndrome who uh, had uh, an enormous increase in, in weight. And you already see the profile of this, uh, of this standing boy who looks over, overweight. And when you look at their um, uh, growth charts uh, during the years, you can see the, the weight is increasing uh, uh, very, very high. And also in patient number two, it is in the higher uh, areas, overweight areas of, of their weights. Yeah, and it stays like that uh, also in later in later life. And this is also something that we saw in our patients that yeah, after a specific age, the, the weight was increasing. So we really wanted to, to look at both the weight and the height to see if it had a specific uh, pattern in Kleefstra, Kleefstra syndrome. And so what we did is, is uh, we have this uh, multidisciplinary outpatient clinic at our second center of expertise for rare genetic neurodevelopmental disorders. And uh, we see in this center, we see patients or persons with, uh, with Kalevsa syndrome, and we use their data to, to ha have, have an idea about the specific growth pattern in Kalevsa syndrome. And we use the data of uh, 49 uh, uh, persons. And of course, I have to say they're all Dutch. They're all from Holland. And so you have to keep in mind that it's, it's specific Dutch data. And we had the data of 15 male and of 34 female uh, persons with Kleefstra syndrome. And uh, we use their medical charts because every outpatient clinic appointment, we use the, the height and the weight. So we could find 224 measurements we could, we could use of height, height and weight. And we calculated the body mask index to have a, a feeling about eh, how, uh, how their weight was according to their uh, height. And we also looked in their uh, charts to see if we could find any influencing factors on growth, a specific pattern or a specific uh, uh, influence. And these are the results of the um, of the um, uh, of our work. This is a very extensive uh, table. We don't have to see uh, we don't have to see everything, uh, but I highlighted uh, I highlighted some of the um, uh, of the data, and especially I want to show you the amount of uh, cardio cardiovascular problems in our in our group. Um, if you can see, it's a very extensive amount of cardiovascular problems. And you can imagine if as a young child you have cardiovascular problems, this will also influence your, uh, your, your growth and your height and your weight. And also the feeding difficulties were 51% of, of the patients, of the persons they had, uh, they, we could register uh, feeding difficulties. And also 20% of the children had frequent pulmonary infections. So these are some of the factors that could influence uh, the, the height and the weight and the growth. 
And this is one of the key uh, figures of our research. And I have to explain it to you because this is the this this figure shows all the data we collected on the length, and we put all the points, the measurements we had for uh, the red triangles are the females and the blue dots are the males, and we we put it at average. So the the big uh, bold line is the average uh, length of uh, children of this age. So it's, it's for all the children in the Netherlands. And if you compare it with average, you can say something about the, distrib about the distribution. And um, I want to show you that at birth, you could see that there is a, because it should be normal if it's uh, below two and above minus two. That's the normal spread of, uh, of weight. And you can see after birth that most of the children with Kleefstra syndrome they are between these two levels. So below two and above minus two. And when you look at the population in general, and if you look at when they're uh, around 2021, you can see that there are more points below average. Yeah, so if, and then if we look at the real measurements, we, we saw that the height at birth was in normal range. And that we look at the average at 18 years, we could see for males, that it was, I put it in centimeters, 172.6 centimeters, which is really below below average. And for the females, it's 164.8 centimeters, and it's also below average. Males a little bit more than, than females. So if we compare the children with Kleefstra syndrome to the normal Dutch population, their, their final height is below average. And we also did this for uh, the weight. So it's the same kind of figure. Yeah, we have the weight and I also, this is the, here's the age. So it's with increasing age, also the female and the males. And it's also uh, um, com compared with the average value and it should be below two and above minus two. And you see after birth, there's, there is this normal spread. But if you look through the years, then you can see that when they're around 2021, most of the points are above average. So um, again, at birth, it looks very normal. Uh, but when you look at age 18, and when then when, when we calculated the BMI, and we said that BMI above 25 is overweight, then we see that of the female persons with Kleefstra syndrome, 65% had a BMI above 25 and the male 50%. So we, we already thought that it would be uh, uh, the case, but it was even more than we, than we expected. And uh, I had a very uh, good student who helped me with this work. And he was very good in uh, all kinds of mathematical uh, uh, programs. And he, he prepared for us also a growth chart. Yeah, like I showed you in the in the earlier slides for other syndromes. And what I want to show you is that because you can use this data to compare uh, children with Kleefstra syndrome to other children with Kleefstra syndrome to see if it's a pattern, yeah, their growth pattern is more or less the same or that it, it's really different than other persons with Kleefstra syndrome. And uh, I think this, this slide shows very nicely uh, the, the differences between uh, female and male because on this side, it's the female uh, growth chart. Here is the weight and here is the height. And when you compare them to the male chart that you can see that uh, especially the weight, the increase in weight is much earlier than in the males. So you see around 12, 13, 14 years, you see this increase in, uh, in weight, which you cannot see in, in the male. And when you look at the, the height, you can also see that there's a difference between females and males uh, because the height stops, to, uh, the, the, the growing in height, it stops earlier than, than the males. The males, they, they stay more, uh, they grow more uh, gradually until 21 and females, they stop more or less around 15, 16. So there's really a difference in growth pattern uh, compared to normal uh, uh, children, but also there's a difference in, in male and, and female. 
So our conclusions is that the final height is below average for both male and female persons with Tapestra syndrome. Uh, the weight at age 18 year and older is above average for both male and female persons with Tapestra syndrome. BMI uh, in, in the range of overweight is present in more than 50% of persons with Klebsa syndrome, females more than males, and the females with Klebsa syndrome show an earlier stop of growth, and the females with Klebsa syndrome show an earlier increase of weight. And what does this mean for my child? Um, um, your child with Klebsa syndrome uh, will gain less height than expected with your parental height. Yeah? So I think this is important to realize that they, they will grow, but they will grow at another pattern than you would expect yeah? because of parental height. And your child has an increased risk for developing obesity. And this is also uh, increases the risk of, of metabolic syndrome. And I think this is very interesting because the next talk will also be about metabolic problems in Klebsa syndrome. And metabolic syndrome yeah, is, is uh, composed of diabetes type 2 and cardiovascular disease. So this is really something we, we have to get, take a good look at and, and, and how we can use this in, in follow-up of persons with, with Klebsa syndrome because we don't know uh, the details at this moment. And, and for persons with Klebsa syndrome, it's very important to develop and maintain an, a healthy lifestyle with a good balance in exercise and food intake. Of course, this is for all children with syndromes. This is very important, but especially in the Klebsa syndrome, I think we really have to take good care of, this, um, of these factors. And uh, for me as a pediatrician, um, and if I have to give advice to other colleagues, I think it's very important around the age of 10 that you should check the thyroid function of the children and also the glucose and the lipid metabolism like cholesterol to see if there are any disturbances because we think that also the thyroid function may be different. So that's also something we have to take, eh? we have to do more research uh, on. And I think for every person with, with BMI above 25, you should really check uh, actively for the development of, of metabolic syndrome. So check the blood pressure, glucose and uh, cholesterol. And um, uh, we really have some ideas about future research to do on, this, uh, on these topics. And of course, I told, hey, I told you something about met metabolic syndrome, but we don't know right now hey, how much this is present in adults, uh, adult patients, uh, persons with Klebsa syndrome. So this should really be something we, hey, we can look at. And I'm also very interested in at the body composition of persons with Klebsa syndrome, especially the, the differences between muscle and fat, hey, and if it is different compared to other, uh, other people. And also these influencing factors of growth should be studied like puberty, uh, thyroid function and lipids uh, metabolism, and also the anthropometry of, um, so the, the different proportions of the body can be, can be studied. And also the feeding patterns in persons with Klebsa syndrome is something we can ha have a look at to see if it's really different because we know there are some syndromes like Prader-Willi syndrome, who really have a different eating uh, eating pattern, but this was never studied in Klebsa syndrome. So I think this should be also something we can have a look at in the, in the future. So um, I also like to thank everyone that is involved in in uh, the research group uh, of our uh, uh, center of, of expertise and all all the collaborators. And um, um, I also like to thank uh, the, the organizing uh, committee and also Professor Kleefstra for uh, letting me, uh, give me the, the talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Dr. Gilan, for that excellent talk. Um, there are a couple of, of really good questions which I might ask you to address on the chat, if you don't mind, particularly about the availability of these charts and the role of certain medications in weight gain. Um, but in the interest of time, while you're doing that, we might move on to the next speaker.